Okay, so um, we'll talk a little bit about, hold on, let me go back to this, um, about um, how you deploy, manage, optimize a network. So a bit of a change of tack from previous ones because we'll talk a little bit more about the, the actual network itself um, and how do you get the most out of it, particularly in a automated cloud environment. So um, just touch on some of the challenges around kind of 5G networks and what's, what's changing um, or what's changed. Um, of course, anything with opportunities always brings challenges. One thing that I don't think necessarily gets talked about enough is the fact that up until this point, the kind of atomic unit of a network has typically been a cell site, right? It's been around a cell site and moving to beams, uh, whether it's a user beam or a coverage beam is a completely different environment uh, for a lot of networks. So that, that's a kind of key element of it. The other part, of course, kind of partly why we're here is networks now becoming cloud native and virtualized, um, which is very different from the environment that we've got today. That's happening, by the way, in the RAN and the core of the network, and we'll, we'll touch on a little bit more of that. Um, the other part of it is that when you deliver some of these services, you know, folks have talked about uh, different types of classes of services, how do you deliver those to the various verticals, um, whether it's um, uh, robots in a forest um, or whatever else, you know, uh, seems to be the best presentation, by the way, today, that one. I really should have brought one of them with me to enhance the visual aspect of a presentation. But anyway, you know, to deliver on that, you need a slice through a network. Um, and, and that's a logical component of a network. And that, again, that's, a, that's quite a different thing. And then the complexity of the network. So that is probably one of the fundamental things that's the challenge for operators and how you deploy services, which is complexity. Because remember, um, with complexity of a 5G network, you not only have to deploy and manage a 5G network, you've got all the previous incantations of your network that you've got before. Right? You've still got to manage your 2G. You might be thinking of turning off your 3G. You're definitely going to keep a 4G network for a long time to come. So you're still going to have to manage that infrastructure at the same time. And just on the complexity, um, if we touch on this, so we touched on the verticals and putting those slices through the network, those services and classes of services are often at odds with each other, so they have disparate needs on the network. So you can imagine the challenges that come with that. Non-uniformity, we've done a lot of things around geolocation and where data gets used uh, within Viavi. Um, that data there, by the way, is for mostly kind of for 4G networks, but maybe for kind of early 5G networks, you need a, a reasonable sample size to deliver something like this. But typically in the 4G network, 50% of the data is consumed by 1% of users, right? 50% of data, but 1% of users. 50% of data was consumed in less than 1% of areas. Um, and there was a considerable cell utilization change within a very small period of time. That's just on a 4G network. That's before you've gone to a 5G network and delivered the various slices of it. And <clears throat> if you look at the variables, uh, tuning two parameters across 100 cells, each parameter having 10 possible values, gives you a big number, right? A big number. And so this is where automation comes in, because honestly, you just cannot manually manage that. It's just not possible in terms of the, uh, the complexity and the number of parameters you've got to deal with. So. Um, the complexity side of things is definitely a, 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 a detractor in terms of components, but having said that, uh, when you look at enabling the 5G verticals, there's lots of different elements that you have to think about. And again, these are often going to have disparate uh, components that are going to affect the particular network itself. So whether it's latency, whether it's scalability, uh, whether it's reliability, whether it's end-to-end, -end, you know, you need that. Uh, whether it's private, so the security aspects that come with that, but they all have kind of different needs and they're all going to be kind of vying for different needs across the same physical network. And let's have a look at a few of them. So I, I, quite, I, I like to often pick events because although events isn't necessarily a vertical itself, it does pull in a lot of different components, you know, for what happens at events. If you think about it is they, 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 they happen over short periods of time You've got a huge number of people all coming together in one place, you know, uh, for a short period of time. You've also got the, the kind of fluid dynamics of people coming to events and going away from events, what happens before, what happens after. 
Um, there's a lot of things that are happening in terms of like 5G enabled events. You know, you've seen a lot of announcements around uh, uh, a lot of stadiums that are now kind of 5G enabled. Uh, the Olympics got 5G enabled. The Super Bowl got 5G enabled. I'm trying to remember all the stadiums. There's, there's about three stadiums, I think, in London that are now 5G enabled. Um, so, so that brings, of course, a lot of capability to it in terms of uh, AR, VR, 360 degree cameras, um, security around that, you know, uh, 3D tracking, lots of kind of components. So it certainly makes, um, as, you, as you see, kind of events much more immersive, as they like to call it. Now, then if we have a look at automotive, so automotive often comes up, but it's not just about um, self-driving cars, right? It's about assisted driving, it's about smart cities. Um, it's about smart roads and of course here you've got various components of, uh, of connectivity. You've got vehicle to vehicle uh, where a vehicle needs to talk to another vehicle. By the way, you don't necessarily have to have a network for that. You can do that peer to peer. Uh, you've got vehicle to pedestrian, you've got vehicle to infrastructure, you know, so I need to talk to the traffic lights or you've got vehicle to the network. And all these, um, all these components, if you like, of automotive require different capabilities and also uh, as you imagine, uh, and we'll touch on this a little bit, is bringing intelligence to the edge of the network, close to the, the, the service itself, which is a, a key element. And the other one I just wanted to touch on is, um, is factory automation. Um, so factory automation, um, again, you know, so you'll hear about kind of Industry 4.0, how to automate a factory. Um, a lot of auto automotive uh, manufacturers have been going around trying to, trying to get 5G uh, factory automation. They've got even down to the level of, I've got a screwdriver that needs calibrated you know, significantly. I think Porsche were talking about this. Um, how do I do that in a, in a secure, enabled environment? Uh, there was one that we were talking to, which it was a private 5G one as an automation. They were trying to connect a, mil a million devices and sensors into this network in a secure environment. So um, there's a lot of elements to factory automation, but I think will definitely be a, a key component in terms of evolution. So on the slices and the cloud aspect of that, if you look at the three classes of, uh, of service that are going to get delivered, the first one is enhanced mobile broadband, and that is basically just really kind of where a lot of the industry is now, right? That's been where we've been upgrading 4G sites to 5G sites, typically connecting back into a 4G core. All right, typically connecting into a 4G core. So it's mostly been the RAN getting updated, but effectively with new antennas and, and, uh, and um, you know, new capabilities in the cell site. Uh, that's to get basically 5G rolled out, and, and that's still basically happening just now. And it's, it's, it's so that we can get better broadband, better access, download TikTok videos, whatever you need to do, right? Um, things start to get a bit more interesting when you go into things like ultra-reliable, low-latency communication. Terrible name, terrible acronym, but anyway, the idea is you're now bringing low-latency communications, ultra-reliable ones. Now here the key element of is that you're then required to put intelligence at the edge of the network. You don't have the latency capability to go right the way through to the core of the network and wait for a response, right? You can imagine like in an automotive environment, you can't do that. Right, the delay is just too high. So you start to virtualize the open RAN and bring intelligence close to the edge. So the application server comes to the edge. The cloud comes to the edge. We were talking about that uh, in a session before lunch this morning, you know, about uh, you know, the data center at the edge effectively. And then the third one, which is machine type communication, you know, which is about connecting lots of sensors, devices. Now here you've got scale you have to deal with, so you really want to be consolidating the capability at the core, you know, and providing that to, of course, the scale of uh, devices having to connect it. So you can see these all have to sit on the same network and you have to manage and optimize and react to that uh, in real time. Okay, so that's the complexity of it. And by the way, when you're doing that, you're still managing all the other networks you're doing. All right, you're still having to do that. Um, so the challenge at the moment is that typically where things have, where, where things have come to um, in terms of managing and assuring and optimizing these type of networks is it's been very much done on a kind of siloed basis, right? You've got the guys here, these are the guys doing the fiber, okay? You've got the guys over here, they're doing the transport. 
Uh, that's the RAND team over there. There's the core team over there. Um, they're the data center guys and so on and so on. So you can imagine in, a, in an open cloud uh, disaggregated network with lots of kind of different technologies coming in, trying to determine how do I get a single pane of glass to tell me at a service level what's happening on the network and how do I, how do I, how do I manage it, how do I shoot it, and more importantly, how do I monetize it? How do I actually uh, deliver on the, um, on the promise of what I can do in terms of services? So, um, and you can imagine this happens right the way through the life cycle. You know, from I'm trying to deploy a network. Imagine just deploying it. Uh, I've got a RAN, I've got transport, I've got services, I've got fiber, um, I've got radio. You know, and I'm trying to basically determine uh, how do I how do I get the best workflow to go and deploy that? When I go to try and optimize it, right, I now have to try and optimize those cell sites with those number of par parameters at the same time as I'm optimizing, optimizing my 4G network. So these siloed point solutions just really aren't enough you know, to manage that. I guess, I guess you thought that was going to be the point. So again, this is where kind of automation comes in across the network, across any kind of workflow that's going on. Um, any different type of user that's involved here and trying to kind of put it into a cloud across kind of one platform. You really need one converged platform to be able to kind of do this successfully uh, from, a, from an operator perspective. Um, and that provides really the, the entire view end to end, you know, across the different elements, whether it's radio access, fiber, data center core. It shouldn't really matter, right, because you've got an end to end service. And that's very different from basically doing it in a, in a siloed environment. Um, and again, it's across the different teams. It could be the troubleshooting guys who actually may you need to even go out and do some field uh, tests. It could be the network operation center. It could be the guys doing the analytics on the network. So you can imagine in this way where you have to automate or you have an opportunity to automate the, the manual processes integrate that data together, set up sandboxes, etc. So this, this gives the view where you know, you've got a different slice of the network, for example, for a different server, and it's, it's going right through the network. That's a kind of depiction of a network in the bottom, which is very different from the, the kind of just a box connectivity network that you typically got today. You now have very much a, a 5G service-based cloud native core, you know, you hear about service providers talking about that, uh, where the, the services are really extracted from the capability of the network. Um, and it's a service, but it's a service based API network. So if you think about this in, in, in medical terms, sometimes I always think about this is you've got sensors in the network, right? Sensors in the network. That's right. Like your nervous system, right? They're capturing the information data. Right, they're capturing all the information across the network. The analytics, uh, you know, to do the work is your brain. That's doing the work, then that's making the decision making. And those two things are separated out. Uh, but you need to look at those across each of the each of the virtual um, each of the virtual segments across the network. Um, Open RAN. I'll touch on this as well. For for example, like Open RAN or ORAN. Um, I think most people will have heard about this generally. Um, there's a lot going on in the market about uh, you know, open radio access networks. Lots of benefits to that, right? There's, so in, ter in terms of basically having one, one kind of device at the radio access network, it's now been split up into three. So you've got a DU, a distributed unit, a CU, a centralized unit, and an RU, a radio unit, all right? These three different pieces. Um, now, of course, that's great. Um, you can do that in a multi-vendor environment, drives the cost down. You've seen some operators already talking about deploying Open RAN. Uh, it can be disaggregated. You've got a lot more flexibility there to, blade, to provide the elasticity you need in the radio access network to support the verticals that we just, we just talked about. But of course, now you've, got a, now you've got a challenge, right? This used to be, I've got a couple of devices here. Um, and it's typically from one radio access network provider, right? I just had Ericsson do it, for example, and Ericsson would do all the testing for me and then give me it. Well, if this is now all from different um, vendors, so you've got a different vendor for radio access units, different vendors from data, um, distributed units and centralized units, you've now got different interfaces that you didn't have to support before. 
because you've now disaggregated the network, you've exploded it out. Um, so you've got to now do, I've got to now make sure interoperability, well, who's going who's gonna to make sure that's going to happen? Right, am I going to get the multi-vendor environment to do that? Am I going to have to do that? Um, do I have to get an SI to do that? How do I do feature capability? Uh, how do I make sure synchronization and timing is important in all these things? How do I do functional testing? Um, and that's a big challenge, right? That's a big challenge. Uh, that's not a simple thing, of course. So there's lots of benefits ORAN brings, huge amount of benefits to the network uh, in terms of the flexibility. But again, it comes with, comes with challenges you've got to do. These things never come for free. And you can imagine um, in the kind of cloudification of this environment, you know, um, automation, that's complicated. We're nowhere near where the industry needs to be in terms of automating things from a network uh, optimization perspective. Um, guaranteeing SLAs, for example, you might be having to guarantee things on, on private 5G networks. This, this idea of the single pane of glass, so you know, what would have gone as we do, would have called kind of swivel chair management when you're moving from that screen to that screen to that screen to that screen, you need a single pane of glass to view this. Um, Manual troubleshooting, I mean, it's just not going to work anymore, right? Um, you know, we talked about the complexity earlier on. How do you manually troubleshoot this? Um, and and how, do you, how do you create a kind of digital twin so I can kind of try things out in the background uh, before it gets deployed? So at least there's a start going on in terms of things like test process automation where you start to kind of de-skill uh, the user who's doing, for example, the troubleshooting or the install or the deployment because you can centralize that and you can cloudify the instruments. Uh, you know, typically before an instrument that you use would have just been an instrument, you do some measurements, you go away. Right? Now you can cloudify the instruments and it becomes part of the, actually part, to be honest, it becomes part of the network effectively, right, this sensor. Um, so you can automate a lot of the processes there um, as part of that workflow and de-skill the end user. Okay, and that, that's a really important thing to, to be able to do. Um, machine learning. Uh, machine learning and AI comes up a lot, uh, particularly when you're dealing with, uh, when you're dealing with um, uh, the complexity in, and, and taking away the manual capability of that. That's also got some challenges, though, because it has to learn, right? Uh, the whole thing about machine learning is it has to learn. You have to look at patterns in the network and you have to determine uh, how you're going. This is a really kind of simple example where you're looking at, for example, thresholds and counters and how it's very easy to kind of miss uh, or, or react too quickly to hysteresis in the environment and you're acting too much or you're not reacting enough and how you're learning. You have to do pattern matching. Um, you'll hear about both supervised and unsupervised machine learning in this environment. Uh, supervised is typically easier. It's, it's the way where you know the end result and you're trying to train the algorithm to, f to take you to that end point. Unsupervised is a little bit more difficult. That's when you're trying to, for example, like you might be trying to optimize a radio access network, um, but you don't know what the optimization is. So you're, you're kind of starting from a blind point and then you try to develop the, the patterns and algorithms that get you there. So machine learning is a fundamental part of automation and bringing capability to, uh, to a 5G network. And then, you know, this, this is the part that is evolving quite well from an analytics perspective. Uh, typically in the past, we've been in the environment where you've looked at descriptive analytics where you're really just saying kind of what's happening. It's not really doing anything about it, but it's telling you something's happened. Uh, diagnostic then starts to look at, okay, now I know what's happened, now I can actually try and find root cause and solve something, all right? Um, so I've evolved my kind of thinking a bit, and I know how to get root cause, and we should be automating that process, right? That root cause should be automated, right? The workflow to get there, um, a lot of that should be automated uh, and less the manual process. Predictive then starts to be, okay, what if I do this, right? So in a radio access network, for example, you might find what happens if I put another cell site here, right? Or, or where should I put another cell site? Or what happens if I tilt the antennas this way or this way? And what's the effect of that on the service I'm going to provide? So you can, you can do predictive um, uh, analytics where you, you try something out, you run it through, you see what the result is before you deploy it. And then you can, 
then you can review it after once and once it's deployed. Um, then, then the last one is when you get to prescriptive. So that's when actually you've got policies um, that are embedded into the network and it's all automated and you kind of just let it run. Okay? Uh, which I know a lot of operators are fearful of, but at some point it's going to have to get to that stage where you have to just kind of let go and let the network do its stuff. Um, it's not like you're going away completely, but you're, you know, just because of the kind of complexity there, you're having to, uh, having to kind of take your hands off the, off the wheels a bit and let it run itself. Um, and we've done a lot of, for example, like predictive analytics where uh, you've done kind of what-if scenarios and got very good results between, okay, if I did this, here's what the result would be, and actually when it gets deployed, that is the result. So really, at the end of the day, in summary, for 5G to be successful, you're going to have to automate a lot of the processes, okay? Uh, you're going to have to cloudify your, your management of the network, and it needs to be, to be honest, embedded in the network. Right, how you manage and optimize network, it can't be thought of as an add-on. It has to be embedded into the fabric of the network. You can cloudify a lot of the sensors and capabilities to then provide that automated capability right through the network. If you do that and we evolve that, then I think 5G will be successful really through all the verticals that we talked about. All right, thanks very much. Thanks very much, Paul. That's brilliant. Um, now, we have time for a couple of questions um, before we say bye to Paul. So, has yeah. anyone got a question from the floor at all? <clears throat> ah, Mr. Mr. Irving, I'm going to come and see you. I know you only touched on it briefly, but we heard a bit about uh, Open RAN from a few other speakers earlier. Yeah. There's obviously a lot of noise in the media. There was a lot of noise at Mobile World Congress from various different telcos and entities. I think the feedback earlier was we're probably not ready for it yet. It's probably not ready and it's probably going to take two to three years. That was the thoughts and feelings of a few speakers earlier. What are, I guess, your thoughts, your opinions on it? When are we ready and, and I guess what are via these? Yeah, and I didn't hear the other comments, but that's good to know. Um, at least it's getting raised as a, as a subject. It's probably, yes, it's, it's, not, it's not deployed, it's not field deployable, I don't think, considerably. Where, where we're finding it, we have a lot of capabilities in the kind of lab and field, you know, as you might imagine. So, um, certainly, ORAN as an environment, we're seeing a lot in our, in our lab environment where there's a lot of kind of testing going on, pre-deployment, um, trialing things out, how do you do performance testing. You oft, one of the things that comes up a lot is being able to kind of emulate the network so you can test it. Right, you know, if I've got like, for example, a RUDU, but I don't have a CU, how am I going to test that? Right, well, you have to have something that's going to emulate the CU to be able to do that. So there's a lot of work going on there where you're kind of emulating components and doing a lot of uh, capability in, in the lab. Um, there's pockets of it kind of in and around, and people talk about like Cloud RAN and Virtual RAN and ORAN and CRAN. It's all really the same thing, effectively, although ORAN's defined by a specific set of standards. I think the time, oops, I think the timing of it, it will depend a lot geography to geography, you know, honestly. Um, I don't like to ever bet on these things, because whatever you do, it's like someone's, the one doing earlier on, I think when we were talking about 2040, I thought, my God, I can barely think what's going to happen next year, you know. Uh, but, you know, so I th I th I'm pretty sure it will happen. It will evolve. The testing environment is key to it, right? Because you can imagine an operator sitting there thinking, right, I'm not going to deploy this thing. I used to have one vendor, now I've got three. You know, and, and a software chain goes on that one. How do I make sure I keep testing that? So, you know, everything comes with a price, right? So, but I think if they were saying, what, two years, did they say? I think that's probably fair. Maybe, maybe it's a little bit pessimistic, you know. All right. Uh, well, I have to say, um, that was one of the best presentations I've ever seen. In terms of, did, you just, did you do that all yourself? Did you put that together yourself? Uh, kind of. <laughs> we, we have help. <laughs> what software did you use to put that presentation? Uh, we we'll have a creative owner in the company. That Unbelievable. That. Yeah, she's Unbelievable. very good. There's, I've never seen anything like it. It was so dynamic. She is very good. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Keep hold of her. Yeah. Um, I actually wonder what we did without her before, or actually. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> now, I think the question on everyone's lips is, um, what is swivel chair management? Because I saw that on the slide and I was... Yeah, I've so swivel chair, swivel chair management is typically... So the guy's in the network operating centre, right? He's on his chair, of course, it moves around. But he's got seven screens, right, right to manage the network. Because that's the screen that's telling him about the RAN. 
that's the one that's telling about the core, this one's got transport, this one's got fiber, this one's got something, you know, and, and, and you're trying to manage if something's gone wrong and you're trying to get to root cause, right? And I'm on that screen, I'm on that screen, I'm on that screen. So you can imagine swivel chair, right? And that's what we're trying to get away from, which is how do you get that single pane of glass, right? Get rid of the seven screens, have one screen that tells you what's happening. I've heard that term um, thrown around quite a bit, actually. Yeah, all right. So it's, it's, definitely <laughs> like, it's definitely something that everyone's talking about. Yeah. They, won't, they just want things simplified. Uh, absolutely. And automate, automated and simplified, right? That's, that's the key element of it. It has to be done, right? Thank you so much, Paul. Oh, great, great. All right, thank you. Paul Gowns, everyone.